obviously a pleasure to be speaking with you as a correspondent for NBC's Today Show, and obviously you over on the CBS side. People are like, what? what's going on here? But I think, you know, the future of television and technology and digital and how everything is shifting is a conversation that we can all certainly relate to. And I want to just dive right in because obviously time is of the essence. And Jim, what's amazing about you leading as president and CEO of CBS Interactive is the umbrella of everything that you cover from news to sports to business to technology to entertainment. That is a very vast pool. And especially in today's era where things are changing, you have to stay on top of trends. It's a lot to deal with. <laughs> it is a lot to deal so with. So right off the top, I want to get into what is the future of TV in your opinion? I want to give you want you to give me three things because last month when we were at the Apple conference, Tim Cook said the future of television is apps. Would you agree with that? And what is your subjective opinion? Well, I definitely think what we've seen is that a lot of the focus is always on television moving to the internet. internet and it is, and, and the internet has obviously moved to mobile, and so you have CBS on your desktop and on, on your mobile device. But the biggest trend that we see and that we're adapting to is, is actually OTT. So people accessing these shows through the internet, but through a box connected to their big screen and watching it on television. So it you should say it, what OTT is for anyone yeah, that doesn't so know over that. the top. Over so the it top. means Roku or Apple TV or Chromecast, any of these boxes or things that are connecting you know, the internet to your TV. And the reason is because at the end of the day, people want to watch on the best screen available. And so they do want to watch on, a, on, a, on their mobile device if they're out of home or in the back of a, a cab. But for the most part, television is still a lean back experience. And if you want to consume long form content, you want to typically watch on a big screen. And that, that goes for whether you're watching Big Bang Theory or whether you watch the Super Bowl, right? We stream the Super Bowl online. We did it three years ago. We'll stream probably seven different games of the, of the NFL this year. But by and large, if it's on your big screen, that is what people will, you know, at the end of the day, watch on. Um, and those numbers dwarf it. So, so I'd say OTT is actually the biggest one for us right now. And we talk about Apple and we talk about Roku and yeah. the future of apps on our big screen. How yeah. many of you guys are familiar with uh, CBS All Access? Raise your hand. <laughs> CBS All Access. Have you crowd. heard of that? International crowd. All right, international audience. <laughs> Dive in because this is actually pretty phenomenal. When we talk about what networks are doing to actually stay on trend and give people all these cord cutters, these people that, especially these millennials that are not subscribing to cable anymore, what is the access that CBS All Access is actually providing? Um, well, and this is another big trend. So, so we provide, if you want to go to cbs.com to watch our shows um, for free, we have that, you can do that. It's typically the, the trailing five shows, so if it's The Good Wife or something else. Um, CBS All Access is a five, nine, five dollars, American dollars, and 99 cents a month um, uh, premium service for what we call super fans. So with that service, you get to watch all shows through all seasons, so all seven or eight seasons of, of The Good Wife. Um, you can get a live linear feed of the show in your, in your local area. So if you're in San Francisco, you could actually stream CBS live through your, through your laptop. Um, it's, there's a lower ad load, so there's not as many advertisements. Like there's a number of things that go into all access to be more of a premium package for the super fan. There's also like additional content. So uh, for those who, who watch Big Brother, we historically always had a $4.99 a month app during uh, the three or four months that that show was on TV. Uh, where you could download that app and you could actually watch the Big Brother household 24 hours a day. So that's now, so that's obviously for the super fan, right? Not everybody wants to do that, but we had six figures of people who wanted to do that every year. So like that product is now wrapped into CBS All Access. 60 Minutes had a premium app that's now wrapped into All Access. So it's really, you know, and you see this as a trend, right? YouTube just launched YouTube Red, which is their premium service. $10 a month to subscribe for additional content, um, additional features. Um, so, you know, that, do you, that do you across the board. think people are willing to pay for that subscription model? I remember a yeah. few years back when Netflix was like, and I can't remember the exact amount, but they wanted to increase their prices. It was like a dollar or two dollars. And I remember my friends were like calling each other. It was like group text. It was like anarchy. People were freaking out. You know, this is a society in which we spend five dollars a day on a latte, but nobody wants to spend the money on the content. Right. That actually, the fact that you gave me is an average of five hours a day watching television. Is that correct? Yeah, it's is there money up, in the subscription model? It's up and by the way, that number's up an hour since 2011. So people are today. People talk about the you know death of television, things like that. 
the, the, uh, the number of hours people watch a day is up from five to almost six hours a day now, or just over the past four years. And it's because they can time shift and they can play shift. So if you add all together, more people watch T uh, CBS today than they did 10 years ago, and people are spending more time per day watching television than, than they were even four years ago, despite all these other options and things like the internet coming along, um, and, and social media and online video, all these things together, it's, um, it's remarkable how much time people are consuming, right? And also consuming so, on mobile. An yeah. amazing statistic that you provided me yeah. with was Yeah, when I joined CBS in 2011, 6% of our traffic, and for those who don't know, CBS Interactive, we're the number seven overall um, web property in the US and top 10 globally. So we're uh, you know, about 400 million users a month, and it covers everything from, from CBS Sports and CBS News, CBS.com, to things like CNET and TV Guide. So collectively, it's number seven. And easily the, the, the biggest premium content or even like original content provider in the world um, by, by unique users. And, uh, and so when I joined in 2011, only 6% of our traffic was mobile, and now it's over 60%. So just in those four years, I mean, our, it basically means our entire business has shifted. So. We talk about content too. I'm going to get back to the Big Brother episode because I think that's a fascinating example. But do you feel that content is king? And with that, we see that yesterday, Star Trek actually got announced on CBS as a... How many people have heard of Star Trek? Wait, come on, somebody give me a <laughs> hand up on Star Trek at least. <laughs> Throw me a bone here. <laughs> so CBS is actually going to be streaming online only. They're going to start on television, is that correct? And then go online only with Star Trek. Right, we announced yesterday we are... Um, making a new Star, uh, Star Trek series that will launch in 2017. And, you know, the first episode will be, uh, will be on broadcast television, but then all future episodes, it's a digital only show. It will be a digital only show, it's our first one. So if you're a subscriber to CBS All Access, you know, again, our premium service, that's where people will be able to watch Star Trek. Do you think moving into that model is then the future? I mean, we're talking about a series that <laughs> started in the 60s, yeah. but of course, could now we're seeing the prevalence of reboots and everything coming right back around, and it's, you know. It's been 10 years. Been I mean, trendy. it's been the last, Star Trek Enterprise was the last Star Trek series, and that ended in 2005. But I read this stat yesterday on, on <laughs> um, 538 that if you're, if you were born in 1987, there was a, a, some version of Star Trek on during 68% of your life. <laughs> or all the different versions of it. Now yeah, it's going to be on full time. Now we have it. We Fantastic. will have it again. Now we'll have it again. But we yeah. use that as an example as is content king and original content for platforms like CBS All Access absolutely necessary for people to subscribe? Um, well, again, I just I think premium services are, are you know, to me, it's, it's part of one big mega trend, which is what I kind of think of as personalization in content but differently than, than targeting things you on a personal basis. To me, I mean tiers, right? So if you're the average casual fan, maybe of our network or of some of our shows, then you're not gonna be a subscriber to CBS All Access. You're not gonna want a deeper relationship to get more shows more often in more places. Um, but increasingly, and again, I think this is a trend across the industry. You have Hulu, you have Hulu Plus, you, have, you now have YouTube, and then you have YouTube Red. Uh, you know, you're starting to see this more and more and more. Think about, we were talking last night about pro wrestling, right? WWE has a huge premium subscriber-based service with over a million subscribers now. And so I do think um, that for those people who want more and are willing to pay for it, we're building more and more content for them. And to your question, is content king? My boss, Les Moonves, always has a quote, you know, there is no second screen without the first screen. <laughs> and of course, I mean, all these services, all these... Um, all these pieces of hardware, everybody who wants to get into the content game needs our content. And so I think the distribution changes, the places that you'll consume it changes, different bundles, you know, again, you're talking about skinny bundles with fewer providers. CBS is by and large gonna be one of those must have providers. And so if we can cre keep creating great content at, at a premium level, then, you know, CBS and then Showtime, which we, we also own, will continue to be a must have for, for you know, whoever's trying to distribute content. Talk about creating great content, but also in the ways that it's being delivered. And I wanna get back to that Big Brother example. Big Brother, which of course is a massive show for many years, very loyal audience. Something that I thought was very interesting and to see if this is gonna be an ongoing trend, to your point, there was an actual uh, added subscription, which is now rolled into CBS yep. All Access, where you could watch the entire reality series 24-7. Yeah. 
Break that started, down for me and tell me, was that worth it and was it successful? Yeah, I mean, look, we've always experimented. For those, again, for people who are not from the U.S., there's a, a huge basketball tournament every year in college basketball called, that we call March Madness. CBS is the broadcaster uh, of that. So it's the college basketball championships. And so in 2005, we were the first ones to create a dedicated um, online streaming service that you could get and watch these, these shows, uh, watch these games online. So we've always been experimenting. And the first experiment for Big Brother came on Showtime, with Showtime After Dark. So for people who couldn't get enough in the one hour of watching these people, you know, bicker in the house during the day, you know, you could watch them overnight on, uh, you know, night vision cameras and <laughs> stuff like that. And, uh, and so, yeah, and so we took that and we said, okay, well, what about a full 24 hours? And it turned out, again, it was, it was you know, well over uh, into the six figures of people who actually wanted to not only watch that, but pay $4.99 a month for the privilege of doing, doing so. Is that a case study then, moving forward? It's a specific you thing. Like, if you think about it, we couldn't do that for Survivor, right? Because it's always a mystery who's going to win every week and who gets kicked off and things like that. There's, uh, and it's taped in advance, you know, it's taped so far in advance that you couldn't really do that. So it doesn't, it doesn't apply to everything, but a premium, you know, sub forget subscriptions or not subscriptions and how you would monetize it, but a premium service that's a niche service for super fans of Survivor, Amazing Race. You know, again, there's so many different ways that you can slice or dice that. For the Grammys, right, we broadcast the Grammys every February. We have, you know, between five and ten separate versions of the, show, of the, the performance um, beforehand, afterwards, backstage, all these things that you can get through our site. That part, that part is free. Um, so we do it, you know, we do it for, uh, for everything. When we stream the Super Bowl, we actually have five different camera angles that you can watch the game from. We have curated tweets and, and basically smack talking that gets brought into the app and all kinds of things that you couldn't get on broadcast TV. Now again, the 114 million people in the U.S. alone who watched the Super Bowl that day, this is 2013, it'll be bigger this year, you know, they're not all gonna watch that, right? But there are in the millions of people who will watch that. And so that's, that's the trend, and that to me is what I mean by personalization being a trend. It's really creating tiers and, and versions of each piece of content that you can slice and dice for people who want different, different you know, aspects of, of a given performance. Talking about trends too, I wanna kinda switch gears and talk about sports, which you've alluded to a little bit. What do you think the future of sports, and obviously CBS being a large player in that space across the board, what do you think the future of technology and television in the world of sports is? Right. And I, I'd like to even dive into a little bit of virtual reality because I think obviously yeah, that's a that's big buzzword, it. especially heading into 2016. That's part of it. Um, yeah, to me, the logical next step, so if you think about um, American football and the camera angles that you can now get I mean, there essentially is a camera hovering over the quarterback at all times on the field, right? The next step is for GoPro, just to stick that right in the guy's forehead, and you can be watching it. Eventually, that'll be in real time. I mean, that's a no-brainer that things like that'll happen. Virtual reality, if you saw the original demos from Oculus or people like Jaunt, you know, as, as far back as 18 months ago, they were giving you ringside seats to a boxing match or a wrestling match. So obviously, virtual reality is going to be a huge way that we'll... Consume. Again, I think it'll take five to ten years for it to move beyond demoware and things that maybe an educated technical crowd like this would participate in and really get to the masses um, because those things take a little longer than I think people realize who are close to the heart of the industry. But obviously, I think those would be the two big ones that are going that way, which again, to me, um, might not be for the masses. They may be for people who, who want that experience and opt into that experience. But I think for those people, that'll be there. Maybe it is subjective too, but I, you know, the first time I experienced, experienced VR on Oculus, it was so immersive and, and it was only one of those experiences that you have to try to yeah. understand and feel it personally right. to really see how you're on that playing field. I was actually with on that, a Navy ship. Oh, it was incredible. Are. But I, I question how, how do you avoid going in the realm of not making that the next 3D TV and having that at a price That's point, right. to your point, it's still at a very early stage, but you know, two, three hundred dollars for extra hardware is a lot to ask for the average consumer. But the thing that will help as it relates to sports is that VR is going to penetrate so many other places in people's lives. So at E3 this year in LA, I, I got an Oculus demo and I was being chased by uh, basically mountain spiders through the Himalayas. <laughs> <laughs> and 
it was as if I was there and looking down. And at one point, I felt this breeze of cold air. And I was like, oh my God, it's so cool. It's getting sensory. It turned out it was just the air conditioning. <laughs> but to me, it felt like I was, I was actually getting cold air. But um, if you think of it, it's going to be into video games and, and education and so many parts of life that I think VR will more naturally translate and won't just be the 3D TV, you know, be at risk of being a niche product. Um, but again, I just think it might take a little longer than people might, might think. For the sake of time, I want to move forward and talk a little bit about branded content because I think we're seeing this fascinating shift in terms of, and this really moves into the entertainment and the news side of things. Branded content as a form of advertising generating is this kind of new model. And it's kind of this new model in terms of how to make more money and shifting from television. How do you approach that? And do you think it's entering into a gray area almost? Well, so I come out of the search industry from, uh, you know, um, the last generation. And, you know, we, I was right at the forefront of, of our sponsored links. You know, do those need to be regulated? Do we, how do we call those out? The FTC we get involved. So now where, you know, everything is advertising and, and there's not a lot of regulation oversight and it could be confusing in certain instances. But for the most part, I think you're seeing just uh, super high quality content being done between content providers and advertisers. So they're starting to team up. And part of this is natural as a, it's something that advertisers want. They always want something unique and creative and, and that isn't just a, a status quo knockoff of something else, which they also want uh, at scale sometimes. But um, you know, I think one interesting trend is you're starting to see content companies having their own internal ad agencies, basically creative agencies, to work with the advertisers. Uh, you know, I could even see that going the other, you could even imagine agencies cr uh, owning content providers because this stuff might come together so much. But we are actively creating video products, we're creating, you know, uh, text-based content with advertisers. As long as you call it out the right way, it actually is really good for consumers, they really like it. And, you know, that, that's kind of another thing that's happening, right? This is the rise of ad blockers. A lot of this is, is because consumers are a little frustrated with the way, especially in the lower tier content uh, providers on the web, um, you know, the way pages are loaded down, they're, they're heavy, they take a long time to load, it's really intrusive, they're not sure about their, how their data is being used. Um, and so I think it's another way that premium providers can separate ourselves is, is through branded content and the things that we can deliver that way. I have time for one last question and I gotta ask you, in this world that we're living in, especially in the last six months, the clickbait is incredible. <laughs> and it's, it's getting a little frustrating. And how do you feel about, especially on the news side, I mean, it is, you've got to attract eyeballs, but the rate at which clickbait, and these articles are like, watch what happens in the next 30 seconds. You're like, oh, and like you get sucked in. Is that right? And how do you approach that? And how do you feel about clickbait? <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I feel like going back 20 years to GeoCities, you know, lower tier content has always been part of the internet, right? It's why I remember reading an article a long time ago of people saying, the future of the internet is it'll be the Scranton, Pennsylvania of media. No offense to Scranton, but that's, that's I grew what the article Erie, Pennsylvania. That is what the article For anyone said. that doesn't know what this is, it's in the middle and, of nowhere, uh, Pennsylvania. You know, I, I don't think that great. that article foresaw how much premium content was going to come online. Um, but that's why I'm proud of the fact that we're, we're the, the largest original content creator, you know, in the world, essentially, uh, online, um, is we're not repurposing other people's content with different headlines. You know, mm -hmm. we are creating all that content. A lot of times other people are repurposing our content. That's just kind of, I think, part of um, playing the game on, on the internet. But whether it's CBS News and 60 Minutes or CBS Sports, I mean, not to mention our shows or, or something like CNET, which is still by far the number one tech uh, publication in the world, you know, we, em we employ real journalists and real uh, video talent and we're truly creating all this. Or we're paying extraordinary sums of money for the privilege of, of having this, this content. So. You know, I, I just think whether it's, it's articles that you'd call clickbait or, or anything else, there's always just, that's, part, that's the great thing about the web, it's just potentially infinite, right? But uh, in the future, I think trusted brands and curation is, is going to be more and more important because there's just so much out there that you can't trust or isn't worth your, worth your time. Last 15 seconds, you can tell here that we know TV because we can follow them to the second and to the minute. Anything you'd like to add or any teases on the CBS side, digitally, that we can look forward to? Digitally. I teased the yesterday of Star Trek. <laughs> Come on, uh, That was Star our big Trek. Te tease. Well, especially because we didn't really give that many details about it. Other than the guy who produced the movies, the most recent two movies, 
is the person producing the new shows. So if you think about it, you know, it's not gonna be some cheesy old school version of Star Trek, right? You can uh, expect a more modern version of it. What's coming on the sports side? On the sports side? We, we, are, we have all eyes on the Super Bowl right now. And it's gonna be, it's Super Bowl 50. It's gonna be in my hometown in San Francisco. I think Jed York, the owner of the 49ers, is coming up here in a little while, so we can Who's your stick buddy? around for a buddy of mine. <laughs> we can stick around and ask him about it. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we have all, all eyes on the Super Bowl right now. It's going to be a, a huge game for us. And you will see some new bells and whistles, I think, online as, as part of it this year, but not anything we're revealing just yet. Anything in terms of acquisitions? acquisitions. I feel like in, in the yeah. millennial space has really not been something that CBS has gone and grabbed. Yeah, I mean... I, I do personally think that it's important to understand who you are and who your brand serves and who your audience is. I don't, I don't think just chasing what's called a millennial audience, or frankly, at this point, they're almost aging out. We're almost focusing now on Gen Z if you want to be focused on the real up-and-comers. But, um, you know, for us, things like uh, MCNs and YouTube content and people have asked us, are we getting into that game or not? And I would say that the business models have not proven out yet. You know, we are focused on uh, having a real business around this content as well and, and not just chasing audience for the sake of it. So I think you could, you know, we'll continue to monitor that stuff uh, optimistically but yet somewhat cautiously to see if it really evolves. Um, but so far it's been really hard for the, anyone in that space to create a real business. So I think that's why we haven't been quite as aggressive. Good place to end. Jim Lanzone, everybody cool. give it up. Thank you.